Thank you, Ed, and it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, I should uh, uh, Good morning, everyone. Um, we won't do this presentation in Chinese, of course. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today um, to include a whole morning of China on, uh, on the program of, of the forum. And uh, uh, for CCBC, it's really great to be here out on uh, on the East Coast. We are, for those of you who don't know my organization, a nonprofit membership organization. And we're dedicated to doing essentially more business and better business between Canada and China. Uh, about 90% of our members are Canadian companies um, that are both attracting investment as well as uh, trading and investing with China. And about 10% of our members are Chinese companies that are investing in Canada as well. Uh, and in fact, there are a number of our members on the agenda today, which I'm happy to see. The government of of Newfoundland and Labrador, Alderon, Deloitte, PwC, um, and, and we even often will get members that uh, stay with us for a few years as they consider China as an investor, um, so I was pleased to see Phil of Marathon here today as well, um, and we always welcome new members. So why are we, why are we thinking about China this morning? Uh, I often like to show this, um, this cartoon to people that say, well, why should I bother thinking about China? Um, you can see here the, the list, which includes uh, Facebook, China, and Irrelevant. I think maybe this week we could replace Facebook with Alibaba, which did its uh, $26 billion IPO in New York last week. Uh, and the fact is China is a part of our business world. Uh, it's a part of our value chains, and uh, in, uh, in, in many sectors I talk to companies that are not necessarily interested in China as a market or a source of supply, but the fact is that China is a part of their market, uh, and it's a part of their competition. And so it's really important that we all understand what's happening in China and how it affects us. Um, and as we look at China versus other countries in Asia, you can see that the opportunity is really outsized. These are 2012 numbers of our bilateral trade, and China uh, amounts to half of the total of Asia. And if you look at the fact that the number two and number three countries, Japan and South Korea, are developed markets that uh, you know people aren't thinking of nearly so much these days as 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 they are as the emerging markets, it just eclipses the others. I feel I feel sorry sometimes for my counterparts at the Canada India Business Council with only five billion dollars in trade when we're at 70. And to be honest, we're not trying that hard to get to 70 billion. If as a country we were really to focus more on China, we could be far beyond 70 billion dollars. Uh, and, and one of the things that we see is that China has evolved <coughs> from a simple source of supply play to both a market and a source of capital. And in some cases, it becomes all three at once, depending on your company and the industry that you're in. But as we look at what's happening in China, we read the Globe and Mail or we read the international papers, and often what we read about is not necessarily what's really happening in China. The, the media has taken a spin on China, particularly since the economic crisis, that doesn't always show us the true picture of what's going on. And so what I wanted to talk about today was five myths about China and what is the real story behind them. Uh, whoops, wrong direction, here we go. So these are the five I'm going to talk about, and I will go through them one by one. Uh, the first one I call, when China sneezes, the world catches a cold. And it's been interesting to see, you know, if you look at pre-2008, pre-financial crisis, China was an interesting emerging markets play. And all of a sudden, when the growth in the rest of the world stopped and China carried us through, uh, everybody's paying a lot more attention to China. But what that means is that when uh, China misses its manufacturing productivity estimates by a tenth of a percent this month, all of a sudden international media go wild. And uh, it's quite interesting that uh, over the weekend, China's finance minister, Lo Jiwei, uh, was quoted at the, uh, I believe it was the G20 finance minister's meeting, as saying, we're not going to adjust our economic priorities based on one uh, metric not meeting its goals. So clearly they're annoyed by this attention uh, as well. And the reality is that China is still growing and it's growing quite well. However, it's a different kind of growth. Um, uh, and I'll explain why in a minute. But first, let's, let's look at whether or not Canadian companies are concerned about this. 
based on what we read in the media. There's a survey that's done every couple of years by the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, and the latest version just came out about a week, week and a half ago. They talked to about 250 Canadian companies that were doing business in and with China, and when they were asked about the changing business risk environment in China, more than two-fifths of respondents identified greater risks of economic slowdown in China as being a concern for them. The reality is there's kind of a new normal of growth. Growth is uh, averaging now about 7.5%, and that's where the consensus estimates pretty much land it for this year. Prior to the economic crisis, China had more than a decade uh, of double-digit growth. So we were pretty used to 10 plus percent. Uh, so in that regard, 7.5 sounds kind of slow, although it looks pretty good compared to most other countries' growth. Uh, but China considers this more of a healthy, sustainable growth. And uh, one of the people who looks closely at this is uh, the chief economist of EDC, Peter Hall. Uh, and he actually has a bit more bullish opinion about China's growth prospects, particularly for 2015, uh, where he sees that it, it may grow as, by as much as 8%. Uh, and Peter, in a, an article that we're about to publish in our magazine, uh, says that there are a lot of concerns out there right now, but the country is clearly in the middle of transition. Uh, he says demand has gone down, but this is temporary. Uh, and that gone are the days before the recession hit when anything less than 9% real GDP growth was a slow year. Uh, Post-financial crisis, 2010 was the only double-digit year, and that was fed by an extraordinary outpouring of global and China-sized stimulus. And uh, that stimulus, of course, has been turned off a bit. And then you have slower-than-expected growth in the rest of the world. So with those two factors together, he talks about most people settling into a new vision of China's expected near and long-term growth. Um, but uh, Hall sees that with global trade ramping up um, at the same time that China is dialing down its public investment, he still thinks it's enough to create more growth next year. And he thinks that when trade comes back, so will China's growth. Um, and this comment about the stimulus money that went in um, uh, in 2010 is, is important because China is looking at what is sustainable. Uh, it previously was able to rely on a model of investment and export-led um, growth. So if the rest of the world was buying its products, the exports were really driving a lot of what was happening. And then China was just driving a lot of infrastructure investment. Um, but it knows it can't do that forever. And so the government of China, in looking at how to keep the economy growing, how to keep enough people employed to keep stability, um, and as well as wanting to upgrade China's industrial base and develop a bigger services sector, sees that it needs to go from being investment and export driven to being consumption driven. And China, more so than any other country, really uh, is very obvious about how it wants to achieve its goals because it has a five-year plan. We're right now getting toward the end of the 12th five-year plan, which runs from 2011 to 2015. And this five-year plan has four basic priorities. Expanding domestic consumption, transforming industries, sustaining development, and promoting social harmony. So basically, you know, you can see that they're trying to work together to keep the environment uh, and, and environmental harm in check, um, moving up the curve in terms of um, industrial transformation, helping people to consume more, um, but also social harmony really being key behind that. In addition, at the third plenum last year, which is a very important party meeting which happens after each leadership transition, um, there was a, an added emphasis on the need for efficient market mechanisms and the necessity to streamline the relationship between governments and markets. And there were 300 plus subsequent reforms related to that. And that's something that as foreign companies we're looking at because this focus on letting the market drive things uh, means uh, different types of opportunity for foreign companies and probably easier uh, methods of doing business there. And we've seen changes even just in the last year in terms of the ease in registering a company um, and a decreased regulation. 
Another study that came out recently that I found very useful is one that McKinsey did for the Canadian Council of Chief Executives. Uh, came out in June. And McKinsey in that study talks about each of these priorities as presenting unique opportunities and challenges to Canadian businesses. So instead of continuing to view China as a low-cost producer, consumer goods firms need to shift their focus to the vast number of Chinese consumers and ensure their new products and services will be designed accordingly. Furthermore, they say, energy and resource firms can no longer expect that the Chinese market will continue to increase consumption without introducing more regulations, particularly as far as the environment goes. Another element of the five-year plan that we watch closely is uh, called the Strategic Emerging Industries, of which there are seven. They include environmental conservation, new energy, clean energy vehicles, IT industries, biotech, high-end manufacturing, and new materials. And these are all industries that China knows it needs to get good at, but it doesn't quite yet know how. So there's an opportunity for foreign investment um, to help these industries grow. And the goal of the government is to increase the share of GDP contributed by these industries from 1% to 8% by 2015 and 15% by 2020. Uh, and I'll talk about some examples later of companies that have found themselves within these strategic emerging industries and have found sources of capital uh, and funding uh, in, uh, in a related way. But I know uh, for many of you in the room today, uh, you're thinking about whether or not China's lower growth versus the last decade, uh, does that mean that there's enough building going on to keep demand humming for commodities, which has been such a boon to Canada's economy? So one of the things that is important to watch is urbanization. Um, and uh, in March, uh, China's leaders review, revealed a new national urbanization plan to move another 100 million people into cities by 2020. Um, China's urban population has grown uh, by about 500 million people over the 30-year period of reform. Uh, in 1978, when the reform period kicked off, less than 20% of the population was urban. In 2012, it was 52.6%. And the government wants to raise this figure to 60% over the next six years through a combination of infrastructure investment, social policy reform, and changes in local government financing. So there will still be a lot of building going on. It will be done perhaps in somewhat different ways. Um, the premier of China, Li Keqiang, has taken a big focus on this urbanization push, um, particularly looking at building smaller clusters of cities. Um, and this planned urbanization for him is meant to generate a significant structural shift in China's economy. Um, he sees it as key to improving living standards and allowing more of China's people to attain the Chinese dream of middle class prosperity. Uh, so in addition to increasing incomes as people move from rural to urban citizens, um, he seeks to transform China's macro economy with this urbanization. Uh, and he knows that widespread urbanization will boost domestic demand, moving the country away from exports and investment-driven growth to economic growth driven by domestic consumption. So that's how this kind of links together. If we move on to the next myth, one of the things we frequently hear from companies, particularly those who might not want to go to China, is that they think you cannot protect your intellectual property there. Uh, the reality is that you can, but you need a multi-pronged strategy. Um, part of the myth is that people think that China doesn't respect IP, that people don't care about it, that the laws aren't good, and the reality is almost opposite. I spent three days last week in some outreach sessions with one of our members, Todd Bissett, who's a lawyer, and he describes how the world has a very inaccurate view of China's IP protection scheme. The laws themselves are world class. China is party to all international treaties that you would expect a country to subscribe to, and those treaties actually supersede Chinese law if there's a conflict. The courts and the judges are best in class in China, their hearts are in the right place, and you can get a fair hearing and recourse. And we have members that tell stories about successfully prosecuting IP violations. The issue is volume. It's a big country. Um, the McKinsey study uh, mentions that the government ministry charged with prosecuting IP violations announced that in 2012 it handled 2,347 cases, which was up 40% from 2011. 
Um, so I, I think that's actually a sign that people do care about IP in China, and in fact, there are lots of cases coming to the courts. So the issue is getting into the court with your own case. It's an enormous market. There's lots of low-level violation, and so authorities sometimes have a hard time getting ahead of the curve. So there are other aspects of your IP strategy that you need to bring to bear, um, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Let's look, though, first at what are Canadian companies thinking about IP? Because again, the word on the street is that uh, companies are just petrified. And in fact, it's enough of a concern that Industry Canada uh, worked with the Asia Pacific Foundation to put a whole section of IP questions into this recent survey. So we have more information now than we did before. So Canadian companies that are either doing business with China or considering expanding uh, are concerned. Over 76% of survey respondents indicated that intellectual property rights are important to their overall business, and protecting these rights remains a priority. But interestingly, while it's a serious issue, IP was ranked as less of a barrier than two years ago. In 2012, 51% of respondents rated IP as a serious issue, and this year it went down to 31%. More interestingly, most Canadian firms that are doing business with China reported that they have not experienced IP violations in the last five years. Only 11% did. And those reported violations tend to affect certain sectors, primarily manufacturing. Um, and the most common complaint involves theft of industrial designs, which is a particular concern for manufacturing firms. And while 60% of those whose IP was infringed noted a serious or somewhat serious impact on their business, it seems that profitability is not impacted. The study did not find a correlation between IPR violations and a firm's reported profitability. Now, there may be other forms of non-monetary damage, but I basically take from this survey that IP is an issue, but it's a manageable issue, and firms are managing it successfully. So what do you need to do to manage it? Uh, the most important thing is to get your strategy in place before you do anything in China. You need to identify the intellectual property you want to protect. Is it a patent? Is it a trademark? And register it early. And then once you do that, and once you're doing business there, you also need to make sure you can get through to the authorities. Get to know the names of the people in the mayor's office in the city where you're doing business, or the people within customs. Um, you know, it doesn't involve corruption or bribery or anything like that. It's simply being known in the place you're doing business, so that when you do need to bring a case, uh, they know that you are there and that you're an investor, and they'll pay a bit more attention to you. And there are two key facts to keep in mind. One is that China is a pure first-to-file jurisdiction for IP rights. Uh, Whoever gets their application in first uh, has, has the rights. And so the best protection is to ensure that you file or register before potential competitors are even aware that you will be in China. And Todd has stories of many of his clients that come to him for help after the fact who tell him how they have uh, gone and done a, a competition between three companies to be their distributor or their agent in China. And they go through the process. They maybe, maybe even have uh, confidentiality agreements in place. They notify the successful bidder. They let the other two know they didn't get the deal. And then they go to register their IP, and they realize that one of the unsuccessful bidders has gone and done it for them, in which case they need to either spend the time to prosecute or pay them off. It's easier not to pay them off. And so we often tell companies that if you have anything you might someday be selling in China, go register it now. It doesn't take a lot of time or money. Another important law fact is that there's a clause in Chinese law that says that awards rendered against Chinese parties by courts outside of China are not enforceable in China. So you may have a contract that says uh, it's subject to the laws of Newfoundland and Labrador, and you successfully prosecute something in a court here, you get a judgment against a Chinese company, you go back to China and you can't actually collect from them. Uh, and so it's very important that in your contracts or even in your non-disclosure agreements, you need to say that it is governed by Chinese law and subject to the courts of China. Arbitration is a bit different, uh, and arbitration decisions outside of China are enforceable, but you can't fix everything with arbitration. McKinsey, in the report that I mentioned, highlights some interesting strategies that companies are using beyond just typical IP registration. Uh, and they have been finding with their clients that companies that were hesitant to invest in China because of IP concerns are now proceeding carefully following varying strategies. Um, 
Companies like Shell have successfully avoided IP issues by using public bidding or co-development. So Shell and CNUC purchased and licensed 13 protected technologies through an international public bidding process that created reputational risk and real economic costs to its local partner if adverse I IP outcomes were to result. Other practices they've found include compartmentalizing knowledge so that only a few individuals have a complete understanding of complex core systems, what I call protecting your secret sauce. And, um, and they find that although IP issues remain a concern, an increasing number of companies believe they can be paid fairly and protect their technology. The third myth is that you can't make money. And the reality is that companies are making money. Um, you, you don't need to lose your shirt in China. Um, the majority of companies doing business in China are profitable, and deals that bring value to both parties tend to bring the most success. So in this recent Asia Pacific Foundation study, 64% of Canadian businesses are profitable or very profitable, with another 24% breaking even. There are similar studies done by other countries all the time. Uh, and the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai has 74% of their companies being profitable. And that's a pretty common number. We see it with the Germans. We've seen it consistently among American companies. Uh, and in some of the American studies, it's even gone up into the 80% range. One thing the Canadian study does show is that the length of time in China makes a difference. So 81% of firms with 10 or more years of experience in China are profitable, while newer firms were only at 48%. Now a few tips on making sure you do make money. One is to ensure there's mutual benefit for both sides. Todd Bissett, the lawyer, has said that he has in some cases advised on contracts where his foreign clients, his North American clients, actually got too good a deal in the contract. And he could see problems that could arise from that because clearly, while they negotiated well, the North American party was perhaps gaining too much benefit from the contract. So he has actually advised clients in the past to maybe tone down the value that they were getting from the contract. Um, because sometimes the horror stories that you hear can come when the situation is too unbalanced. It's also important not to put your business on autopilot. A lot of Canadian companies, while they want to go into China, they're not necessarily big companies, and so their executives don't necessarily have the time to spend in China, and so they might give the business to a distributor or a partner and simply trust that partner to do the right thing. It's important that you also keep track of whether or not they're doing the right thing, whether it be a, a partner or an employee, um, you need to watch for changes to regulation. Um, and you need to also consider what I call differing realities. So one of our members is a company that does antimicrobial coatings for industrial fabrics. And they have a good business selling into China and have been for quite a few years. And they were selling through an agent who assured them that their clients needed payment terms of somewhere between 30 and 90 days. And so the company just accepted that. At some point a year or two ago, for various reasons, they decided to bypass their agent and invest directly in China. And when they then went out to their customers, they realized that everyone would pay them in cash upfront before delivery. A totally different reality and a much more profitable one. Uh, we do recommend to companies that although you should act quickly when you want to get into China because things are moving so quickly there, it's important to take logical steps. Um, one of the things that we do for companies is offer them incubation space in our Beijing and our Shanghai offices so that as they, for example, hire their first employee in China, they have a place to house them in a Canadian environment with colleagues that can actually watch them and keep an eye on them, not, not as a, an overseer per se, but we have in some cases with our incubation clients been able to observe employees perhaps taking advantage of their employers. And, alerted them to that before it showed up in perhaps a lack of profitability. Finally, I think it's worth mentioning that about a week and a half ago, Canada ratified the Foreign Investment Protection and Promotion Agreement, the FIPA, which is an added level of uh, benefit and comfort for Canadian companies doing business in China um, because it helps to protect us there. It helps us to bring cases if we are not being treated fairly. And so that's something that's very good for Canadian companies. Myth number four is one that, although prevalent around Canada, I suspect is not necessarily the attitude of the people in this room, which is good, but it's something that I heard a lot when um, 
when the uh, Sinook Nexon deal was taking place. And that's that if we let Chinese companies invest in Canada, we'll give up sovereignty over our resources. Um, I remember being interviewed by a CBC Ottawa reporter about the net benefit of the Sinook Nexon deal. And af after talking about, very logically, the benefits, she finished the interview by saying, but, but, but they're all communists. How can we let them invest here? And I was very surprised to hear that from a, you know, a national reporter. Um, and unfortunately, surveys of average Canadians show that they are not particularly predisposed to Chinese investment. However, Canadians didn't like American investment in the 60s and 70s, and they hated Japanese investment in the 80s. In general, uh, the average consumer's attitude toward foreign investment is not particularly positive, but the fact is that foreign investment is essential to Canada's prosperity, and when a company invests here, they follow our laws and our regulations. Um, one of the things that if, if, as you look at investment, is useful to, to, to watch is why are deals getting done? So there are definitely trends that happen in China that determine the volume of Chinese investment that comes in. Um, so there was a going out strategy that started more than 10 years ago now. And every year you see tweaks to it as to how much the Chinese government encourages or limits companies to invest overseas. And it's often very much aligned with the goals in the five-year plan. Um, and the, un unlike some of the myths that occurred around some of the major investments in Canada, it's really all about diversifying source of, sources of supply, meeting goals of growth in the five-year plan, and indirectly upgrading China's industrial and technological base by creating more international, more experienced companies. Um, you know, in, in building that international capability, a Chinese investor doing business on Canadian soil builds an awareness of and a respect for our regulations, processes, and business culture among their executives, which I think is a good thing. And one of the things we're seeing in several sectors is the positive impact that Chinese investors can have on Canadian firms in their supply chains. A great example is Sinook and Nexon, which now has an annual program to take companies in its supply chain, which are mostly small and medium-sized enterprises, to take them to China and do direct matchmaking for them with its subsidiaries and other companies in its sector. And these are meetings that would be very difficult for the companies to get on their own. Um, so it helps Canadian companies better address the China opportunity, and we'll see more of this, not only from Sinook and Nexon, but from other investors. If any of you in the room are involved in offshore oil and gas, they are starting that recruitment process for next year's mission now. So if anyone is interested, please come and see me. The other thing I would encourage all of you to do is to speak up about investment from China being in your interest. Unfortunately, some of the voices around investment are negative, and we need to make sure that the positive voices are also all, also out there. Sometimes we're just so busy doing business that our, our companies don't speak up about it, but I think it's important that we contribute to the debate. The final myth is that China will be there when Canada is ready to engage. So as I mentioned at the beginning, our $70 billion in trade and investment is it's not that great compared to what the rest of the world is doing with China. Our bilateral relationship has been a bit slow-paced at the federal government level, and honestly, we see that Canadian companies don't move as fast as our competitors in other countries. Uh, let's take use of the renminbi as an example. Recently, HSBC did a survey of companies in a, a number of different countries to see how many were using the renminbi in their trading and in their contracts. And the average among all the countries they surveyed was 22%. The average in the U.S. is 17 percent, and in Canada, it's 5 percent. What, what is it that, Canadian, that, that U.S. companies know about using the renminbi that Canadian companies haven't quite gotten yet? One of the things we do see is that you can get a couple of extra points in a contract if you're willing to deal in China's currency, and it's very easy to open an account and trade from Canada these days. The, uh, another thing that I like to point out is that China has been essentially warning us in many different ways that their windows won't stay open forever. Last year we held our AGM in Beijing, um, and at that AGM we had a speaker from the China Development Bank that delivered a message that was very similar to messages heard by the Governor General when he was there that same week, and various federal ministers 
that was basically saying, we still want to invest in Canada, but we don't get the feeling that we're very welcome or that the infrastructure building to support our investments is really moving. And uh, the problem is that the windows that are open to support energy investments and resources investments are related to things like the five-year plan. Once those things are built, they don't need the resources in the same way. And so it's important that we try to be as aggressive as we can be and to look for where those windows are open. So I'll just close with a story about my own experience. The, uh, the multinational company I worked for for 11 years was Eastman Kodak Company. I remember back when you used to shoot film and you used to print your pictures on paper. And in the mid-90s, we went from a situation in China where we couldn't sell anything in China. Anything that landed in China was sold in another country and was imported by a distributor. But China decided that photography was going to be deemed a non-strategic industry. It didn't want to have to deal with its money-losing state-owned enterprises, which all had old technology and bad products and were sitting on environmental wastelands under their factories. And so in that transition, there was an opportunity for a foreign company to make a big investment, a big greenfield investment, and to work for mutual benefit with the Chinese government to figure out how to transition that industry. Because we were there and we were watching, we were able to get in and get a head start over our competitors and set up our business in China exactly the way we wanted. And I remember being on worldwide conference calls where the U.S. was really struggling with slow growth, and they'd say, hey, China, what do you got this quarter? And our China team would be able to pull a few extra million out in revenue uh, and really help things along. That didn't last forever because technology changed. We all started shooting digital. But for a period, that was really beneficial to the company because the window was open and because we were there to engage. So I'll stop there and uh, move to our next speaker. In fact, let me grab another piece of paper for my moderator role. Did we want to transition everybody down? OK. So thank you. And uh, just one minute, and we'll transition to the next speaker. Love it.